Hey everybody, this is a study from First Love Calvary Chapel uh, on Sunday morning, <clears throat> 9 a.m. and um, 10 o'clock. We're going to have the same study <clears throat> and I'll be there in person. But it is when we compromise. And so we might be tempted to and we might have already and over the history of our lives we might have something that's called compromising and it could be compromising with the world with your own values with your own um, thoughts of what you think are right and wrong it could be compromising with what you know the Word of God says and so it's here's what the world says here's what the Word of God says but here's how you feel or here's what you want to do and so I think that this is not unfamiliar territory with the Christian. We understand that there is a battle between good and evil inside of us. There is a sinful nature and there is the divine nature. And so, you know, the world wants you to kind of flex with its every whim and do whatever the world wants to do. And so the world says this, and yet you have the Holy Spirit speaking inside of your heart saying, but God says this. And so we find that battle we find those inner and personal contradictions that go on. And then when we find that we have a heart that is compromising or compromised, where do you go? You go to the throne of grace. You go to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so sometimes if you're doing a lot of compromise in your life and going in and out of this or that compromise, you can actually become confused. You can actually become afar off. You could actually end up drifting. And I'm sure that's not what any believer wants to do because we're in relationship with Christ and we want to be as close as we could possibly be. Um, now, our, our sinful nature has its desires. It has its enticements and the things that it's drawn to. And so there's what the sinful side of us wants, but we can't cooperate with that. We have to recognize that. We have to see that that sinful side is contrary to us, contrary to our new nature, that it is sin that dwells in us. And so that's where the battle begins. That's where the good fight is and laying hold of salvation every day is. You know, the Bible talks about planting bad seeds and reaping corruption. And, and there's a scripture in Galatians chapter five, verse 17, and it says, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. It says, so that, and listen to this part. It says in Galatians 5, 17, it says, so that you do not do the things that you wish. And there are things that we desire in the flesh. And our, our mind is, is battling with whatever we know that the spirit wants to do in our lives. And there have been those points where, you know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But then there are those points where the righteous man falls seven times, according to Proverbs 24. And, and, and that you're getting back up and you're realizing, you know what? I don't want the world. I don't want self. I don't want the devil. I don't want to be lost. I, I want to move forward. I want to just be who I am in Christ. And so that's what you have to do is you have to get back up and you have to recognize who you are. You're born from above. You're washed in the blood. You are the righteousness of Christ in, in, in that relationship with him and so the devil himself through his you know demonic realm or whatever um wants us to remain in a very iffy stage of our walk with the lord well i don't know if i'm really called and i don't know if i really should go to church um i don't really know if i um you know if it's going to amount to anything if i really live for the lord well i mean it's like going to the gym right is it really going to amount to anything well if you go regularly it's going to amount to something if you're laying out in the sun after a while, it's going to amount to something. And believe me, spending time with God and, um, you know, sharpening and gaining godliness, it, it all builds upon itself as you draw near to him. But oftentimes, um, Christians can be picky and choosy in how they want to be and how they might even not want to come off and look. Well, I don't want this type of Christianity. I don't want to look like that type of Christian. I don't want to be anything extreme. I, I just want to go to church and follow God. Because when you see people that seem to be on fire for the Lord, um, sometimes people will say, oh, you'll grow out of that. Or you need to tone that down. Kind of like a, a crying child. And, you know, can you shut that baby up? Um, you know, as some person who doesn't have children has no understanding and, um, you know, yells that out on a plane. Um, but, but truly, we have a heart that's crying out to the Lord. And 
what can restrain us? What can hold us back? But yet our affections can hold us back. Yet grieving and quenching of the Holy Spirit can hold us back. And so we have to watch ourselves, be alert to what can happen, that compromises can corrupt, and that we have to be aware of our own sinful nature and the things that would cause us to go astray. And to one of the churches in the book of Revelation, out of those seven churches, Jesus said, strengthen the things that remain that are about to die. And so are there things that are good in your life that um, are there still, but they're you know on life support? Well, you know what? Get back to church. Get back to your Bible. Get back to worship. Get back to the simplicity of the gospel. Get back to the basics of seeking the Lord. Because even in seeking the Lord, as Christians know, we can still fail and do miserable things. But I'll tell you what, it's still the best place to be because it realigns you, it balances you, it anchors you, and it keeps you or gets you back on track. Um, also, a few more things is to be an extreme person and people, you know, feeling like, oh, that you got to tone that down. And then, of course, you begin compromising if you're, you're toning down from what you're supposed to be. And because, excuse me, the devil wants you to be less of something. He wants you to be, um, to, to make you less extreme than you need to be to be, to shine for Christ. And so it's like that person yelling on the plane at the baby, you know, at the mom, tone, you know, quiet that baby down. You know, um, the devil's yelling, the world's yelling at us, you know, tone it down. And then all of a sudden we're, we're just compromised. Um, we have to figure out all of our angles um, about how do we please God in a fallen world and still having a sinful nature that we're dealing with. We've got to make sure that we are focused on the Lord and the things above to prepare ourselves for the future that God has for us. Maybe you're not married yet and you got to find the angles of your life where maybe, okay, you're playing house over here. You're acting like you're married to this person. You're treating her as a wife, but you know, maybe you just need to grow up in the Lord and say, ah, then I better marry her. Or um, maybe there's the world's perspective on things and you're just going, well, maybe they're not wrong. Maybe we're wrong. And I read this and they say that, that makes sense. And um, you know, you got to get back to the Bible and go, you know what? God is right. And I'm going to say, amen. And so th there's compromise that can happen. I mean, obviously with evil, and then even sometimes things with that are, things that aren't necessarily evil, they're just weights or things that can even sometimes be good, but not in moderation or, or too much. And so, um, you know, sometimes people, when it even comes to good, they don't want to come off too good. Um, you know, the Bible says um, there are none good, no, not one. Um, but truly, when it does talk about good in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter seven, verse 16, it says, don't be overly righteous, nor be overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? And that's kind of a funny thing to think, why don't be overly righteous? Then it says, don't be overly wicked, nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? In other words, God wants us to live a balanced life. Sometimes a person who's acting overly righteous can become self-righteous. And a person who's overly wicked, they die before their time. And so the scripture talks about behavior. But we know that behavior is related to relationship. It has to do with drawing near to the Lord and recognizing that he loves us, recognizing that we need to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then also, um, evil itself is designed that, it has a design that we would come up with various creative compromises in our lives. Things that we could get away with. Things that, okay, well, the law says this, or God's word says that, or the law of Christ says this, but I'm really not doing that. It's really gray. And so I'm not doing the black and I'm over here, you know, uh, dabbling or, or that kind of thing. And, and once again, as Christians, um, as we know, that's not beyond any of us. And, and as that saying goes about a person getting away with murder, that as Christians, we want to catch ourselves. We want to see what's up, what's going on, um, where we're at. You know, a, a government official that would take funds or monies from a foreign adversary would become, they, they would become, um, what's the word I have here? Compromised, I mean, that's what our study's about. They become compromised in order to be a good um, government official because now this other government could tell them what to do because of the money situation. Um, for us, if we are compromising with evil, 
too much and not catching it and not having a short list with God, then we might not be able to talk to someone about their evil. We might feel ashamed. We might feel like, well, look at me. And so who am I to talk to them? And, you know, judge not lest you be judged. And, and, and so we end up holding ourselves back to being a blessing to others. Um, and then also, if we are hanging around with evil company, those things that can really mess us up, people that can really draw us away and entice us to worship other gods, um, you know, he who walks with a fool will become foolish. And so if, if we do that, we will become like them. And so we have to also know who to draw away from that maybe is contaminating and influencing us the wrong way. And we have to find some better fellowship. That's why it's good to be in church. It's good to be around Christians because you might find somebody that's on the same track as you are and trying to serve and to follow God. In Isaiah 47, it says, for you have trusted in your wickedness. And you said that no one sees me. That's Isaiah 47, 10. Now that's the fact of sin. Sometimes, you know, behind a closed door or in darkness, that sense of nobody sees me. And it says that your wisdom and your knowledge have warped you. And you have said in your heart, I am and there's no one else besides me. So sometimes you're so caught up in yourself. And, and the fact is, is that the Lord does care that there is one day that we're going to give an account, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for everything that we've done while we lived in our bodies. And in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not grow weary while doing good. Because as we're following the Lord, we get beat up. There's an assault going on. And we could grow weary because we've had some of these seeds of the world planted in our heart through something you watched on TV, through something you looked at on your phone. And, and that seed of the world can grow and it can grow roots and it could take over. And so it says that, you know, we can reap corruption or if we're sowing to the spirit, which would have to go into church, worshiping, reading our Bibles and getting into the things of God. It says we reap life everlasting, like it's planting good seeds and it's building all the good things of faith in us. And so, yes, there is a war. There is a battle for all of our souls. And so what is that little, even that little leaven, that little tiny compromise with evil that you might still have? And the excuse is also that you might make, well, you know, I was born into sin and sin did my mother conceive me. But guess what? If you're born again, you also were born from above. And so in eternal life, did your savior conceive you? And yes, it is true from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil that Adam partook of and it was passed on to all of us. We've all got this thing going on where we have this knowledge and we have this desire to know and to know something that we think will make us wise that might benefit us in some way. But actually it's the devil's trick to kill still and to destroy us. In Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9, it teaches us that we can't even trust our heart because it says that the heart is deceitful above all things who and desperately wicked who can know it. I the Lord search the heart and I test the mind and he says, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. So as we recognize that our heart is a heart that is prone to wander and that there are potential possibilities of going astray, we have to make sure that we're always keeping our heart in check and that we're always running back to the Lord if there is even an inkling and even a, a part and portion of that which is not good. In Mark chapter seven, verse 21, Jesus said, for from within and out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness out of the heart. Now, of course, Jesus died to save a sinful heart, to wash that sinful heart with his blood. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Do we all say amen to that, right? And then in Proverbs chapter four, verse 23, it says that we are to guard our heart above all else. So the things that come out of the heart, we better just guard it before it even you know, goes into the heart or comes out of the heart. It says, for it determines the course of your life. And so I, I think we all want to have good days and we all wanna see the Lord work in our life and we have gotta just make sure that um, we're keeping things in check. Now, there's that story in Proverbs of the unsuspecting young man who probably knew what he was doing as he went out at night. But it says that, um, 
you know, Solomon looked through the window of his house. He looked through his lattice and he saw among the simple guys and it perceived among the youths a young man that was devoid of understanding and passing along the street near the corner and he took the path to her house. Like he knew where her house was. He knew where enticement and seduction and what he was looking for was and he took that path. And the scriptures teach about you know the Lord keeping us on the paths of righteousness and and not walking in the ways of darkness and not rejoicing in evil and not standing in the paths of the sinners and so sometimes we've got to recognize whoa I am on the wrong path let me catch myself right here and you know what even in the middle of sin or in the middle of compromise you could still catch yourself in Deuteronomy chapter 32 it says in verse 32 it says for their wisdom is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah and their grapes are grapes of gall and their clusters are bitter their wine is a poison of serpents in other words sin wants to bite into you sin wants to poison you and compromise is what we're talking about because this was written to God's people you know that, that you're eating the grapes of Sodom and you're you're reaping harvest from the fields of Gomorrah and that we have to just really watch and ask the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit because we should have some conviction going on right you should, when you're in your Bible study, hear the word of God speaking to you. But you got to say, Lord, are there any grapes and harvest going on that's of this world? Because your foot can slip in due time and your calamity can be quicker than you even know. And yet the Lord can empower you again with his power to get up and to leave that situation and to get back into the fullness of Christ in your life. And so we sometimes need to have a little meeting with ourselves. Not like somebody else, I gotta meet with you. I've got to meet with myself. And I've got to challenge myself to that higher calling that God has said. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, you know, not that any of us have attained yet, but we're pressing on and we're laying a hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of us. And it says in verse 13, brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, I'm forgetting those things that are behind, he says, and then I'm reaching forward to those things which are ahead, and I'm pressing toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Are you pressing forward? Are you trying to move up or are you going down? And so that meeting with yourself, you gotta speak to yourself. Hey self, you're wandering. Hey self, you're going astray. And so you have that self-confrontation moment, not condemnation, but definitely bringing yourself to the throne of grace about that inner friction that's going on to cast down those idols and all of those high things that are exalting themselves against the knowledge of God in your life. And so you're taking your thoughts, because that's where the war is, right? And you're bringing them into obedience, into captivity to the Lord. Lord, here's my thoughts. I lay them down before you. And so God can deal with those areas of your life that are personal contradictions where the world says this, but God says that. And so you have to have that moment where you get serious with yourself. You're not just winking at yourself and brushing it off and saying, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so, but recognizing the desperate wickedness and not wanting to feel that cruddiness that you've been feeling in those moments of weakness. So we have to also look that we're part of not just ourselves, but we're part of a church. And sometimes when one person is compromised, it spreads to the, the whole batch. And, and so we have a wonderful church in Whittier. But if we see things that are even small, little foxes that spoil the vine, we've got to look and go, well, what in this culture and in this world and at, in people's workplaces and homes are they bringing into the church? You know, what is destructive? And, and we're not out to judge all the people that are there. We're just out to know, okay, what does the Holy Spirit want to do here? What does he want us to pray about? What does he want us to encourage our, our, our brethren in so that way their hearts do not become hardened through the deceitfulness of sin so we not only have that meeting with ourselves but we have that meeting with beloved brethren in the church not in a um, you know bring the adulterous woman before and let's stone her in, in some sort of condemning way but speaking into those that we love just like a parent would speak into their child but giving you know the good word of God in an encouraging way um, there, there's a lot also that can be done to teach a church um, the opposite of what the world teaches and what popular culture says is right and yet God says is wrong. And so oftentimes, and not all the time, but oftentimes the world is not in line with what God teaches. And so, you know, our, our desire is to become more like Christ and less of the world in us. Um, and, and so we've got to recognize where is that worldly pride? 
Where is that love for other things? Where am I becoming lukewarm and growing cold in my life? And then that's where I need to take my stand for my faith and my family and my future. In Nehemiah 4.14, he says, fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters and your wives and your houses. See, it's not just gonna affect you. It's gonna trickle down to your family. It's gonna trickle down to the church. And so we have to just kind of get ourselves in order so that way we can help others get in order in, in, a, in a wonderful way so we can all just rejoice before the Lord and not be destroyed with the wicked. And so what do we do when sin is abounding? Well, yes, God's grace is there in your life, but we don't sin that grace may abound. So what we have to do is there are things that we have to put aside, things that we have to cast off. There's things like, you know, cut off your right hand, pluck out your eye, as Jesus mentioned. And we have to ask the Lord, Lord, what is that? What is that mountain that needs to melt like wax? And, and so what do I need to do? You know what? A lot of Christians nowadays, especially young people, aren't into going to church. But I'll tell you what, you need to go to church now more than ever. You need to have devotions to hear the word of the Lord in, to you in a personal way because the world is competing for your life. And so we need the wisdom of God to navigate through these ugly times that we're living in. And, and yes, every season, whether you're a kid, whether you're a teenager, whether you're a young adult, whether you're just newly married or whether you're an old person, each season has its own pitfalls and its own situations that you never faced before, but now you're going to face. And in those things, God is also testing you and looking at, are you going to lay hold of him? Are you going to, you know, come to the cross? Are you going to say, as Peter was falling in the water, and you know, the Lord grabs his hand, Lord, help me. So the Lord can help us to not compromise, to not make a covenant with the enemies around us as um, Israel did with the inhabitants of the lands that were around them that be became an actual snare to them. And so yes, all do fall short of the glory of God. And yes, we all do stumble in many ways as it says in James chapter three, verse two. But I will tell you that the Lord is the one that lifts us up. The Lord is the one that gets us back on track. And that's why we need to come to him, always come to him. And we can expect better of ourselves. We can believe that his word can happen in our lives. And we don't have to just believe the worst of ourselves and just go, well, this is just the way I am. And it's just my sinful nature. And well, this is, you know, this is just where I'm at. No, God is a lifter of your head. God is the one who puts his wisdom inside of you. And he gave us all that we need for life and for godliness, according to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. And so be careful that you don't become dull hearted in these days and not tuned in to God. You know, as um, God told um, the warning to kings in Deuteronomy 17, 17, about not multiplying wives for themselves, lest their heart would turn away. Compromises turn the heart away. Not immediately. When you look at Samson, it was little by little that his heart was turned away. And so we, little by little, grieve and quench the Holy Spirit of God, and we close off our hearts to him. And our prayers become hindered and we block our blessings, and we block the will of God in our lives. And, and sometimes it's blocked because of something we've done. We're blocking it through our unforgiveness, through our unconfessed sin. And we need some godly wisdom from above that isn't the sensual kind that the world says, but what God has spoken to us through his Holy Spirit. And sometimes, even in compromises, godly repentance is needed. So that way our hearts don't grow hard, as it says in Ephesians 4.30 that um, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And remember the story of Peter. It looked like he kind of compromised with his stand, right? I'll die for you. And then boom, he's denying him. And then look at Judas. What was going on with the guy? He loved money. He believed better for himself than following Christ to the end. And so now one came back to Christ, the other didn't. But we have to keep ourselves in check because you know we could be one or the other. And even Cain, somewhere along the line, when God spoke to him and said, sin is knocking at your door, but it wants to have its way with you, but you're supposed to overcome it. He didn't overcome it. And then Esau gave up his birthright. And there was a point where he prayed and it was too late to pray. David compromised with Bathsheba and at other times with the um, numbering of Israel. And he didn't really go by the word of God in his life. And Paul mentioned in the book of Romans, chapter six through eight, that internal struggle that all Christians go through, where you know, you're know you battling between sin that dwelleth in you 
And yet there's also that new nature, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so don't ever back down from hanging out in God's word and believing that God's way is the right way, no matter how strong the world is or how strong your sinful nature is. Because you know what? We can quench uh, the passions of the world when we turn on more of God inside of us. Um, and there is straying that happens. There is deviating from a path that happens. But the scriptures say he makes us wiser than our teachers and we become discerning to know the difference between good and evil. And I'll tell you what, no matter how far you've strayed or how far the compromise has gone, I will tell you that God will help you get through because God helps you through anything and everything. You gotta just listen to the counsel of the Holy Spirit within. And there are others that God puts in your life to also speak into you and, and to show you yeah, that's stumbling, that's compromise. And the enemy is trying to get you off of God's path. And you know, we, we live in these times that everything is geared toward getting you off of God's path. But he has his standard of righteousness, which is following Christ. And so we need to focus in on our love of God. We gotta focus in on where we're going and that's to heaven. And we need to love him by seeking to obey him and following his word and, and, and really trying to walk in wisdom by having the fear of God and trusting in God and believing in him. And that if we do fall, we get back up. And, and just like the Lord, you know, gave that story about um, to, to the disciples, if you're, you know, when the disciples said, if I, my brother sins against me, you know, 70 times, what should I do? And Jesus says, forgive him 70 times seven. Well, if you're supposed to forgive your brother that many times, then how many times has the Lord forgiven you and would he forgive you through all of your ups and your downs? And so it's nice to know too, brethren, when it comes to compromises, small or big, that struggling isn't necessarily practicing and that at any time you can recognize the error of your way and hold fast to the Lord of your soul. So, you know what? Focus in on certain things that the Lord is doing in you in the struggle. That maybe some of it's your own ignorance. Some of it's your own unbelief. Um, some of it's that, you know, the cells of your brain have been compromised from the things that you've seen. But you know what? Listen to what God is saying when the Holy Spirit is blaring in your heart and saying, abstain, turn away, or behave moderately, or whatever he's saying in a situation. Um, Galatians 5, 7 says that you ran well, but who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. So where's it coming from? Yourself, the devil, the world? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. But then Paul said, but I have confidence in you, in the Lord. So little by little, brethren, the devil is definitely chipping away at you. And, but yet, just like the prodigal son, the Lord receives back those that have been compromised if they return. You can't just pick and choose what you want from the word. We have to listen to all of it and let it convict us. And we could eat too much of the world and be throwing it up out of our noses as the children of Israel wanted that manna, that quail. And God allowed them to have it, but to show them, is that really what you wanted or shouldn't you have been satisfied with what I gave you? So as far as compromise goes, we can't even compromise God's word. We need to say amen to all of it because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. His word corrects us and it is inerrant and gives us all the training we need for righteousness and to know what is a stumbling point or not. So if the doctor gave you something to help you with a diet and you didn't do what the doctor said, that could bring forth death in your life. And the book of James talks about our own personal enticements that when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it's full grown, it brings forth death. That's James chapter one, verse 15. Is there death coming in your life through compromise? Well, if you can help a brother or sister take the log out of your own eye to get the speck out of their eye, but also if there's a speck in your eye or a log in your eye, don't think that it can't come out. God can do great, remarkable things just like he did on the day that you were born again. Maybe you've been broken down through things. Um, maybe religious people have handled you wrongly. And there is definitely an assault on you, definitely an assault on the church of God to keep you ineffective and the rest of his body ineffective. Maybe you've been overtaken by the devil to do his will. Well, guess what? I'm just encouraging you right now through the love of Jesus Christ 
to be restored according to Galatians chapter 6 in the spirit of gentleness. Maybe you've been overtaken with some compromise, but you know what? The Lord still loves you. The Lord is still for you and not against you. So you got to come to him now. You know what? He, he is going to not move away from you. You draw near to him, he will draw near to you. And he will put his righteousness upon you. It's not your own righteousness. It's directly from him because um, he made it available to you. So don't cast his word behind you today. Listen to what's being said. And God will help you through all of the junk in your life. And God will help you to rise above through Jesus Christ because he loves you and because you want to and because you want to honor God. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for speaking to us. And I pray, Father, that your word would have power to lead any brother or sister or young person out of any compromises that would be hurting them or hurting their family or hurting their future or even hurting the church. And so, Lord God, we just pray that you would be a blessing through your power and through your spirit, Lord God, to help each one navigate their own destructions, Lord God, so that way they could walk in the path of life and the eternal life that you've given them and not with all of the weeds and the ugliness that the world would bring. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help them to stay on the path of righteousness for your name's sake. In Jesus' name. And one more thing. If you haven't received Christ, say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Say, I want to be born from above. I don't want to love this world. I want to love you. Say, I want to follow you. Say, forgive me of my sins. In the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So God bless all you guys. Um, 10 a.m. Church at First Love Calvary Chapel. I'll be there. All right. God bless you.